So what I wanted to talk about today was a particular research study that I've been working on, but I'm wanting to use this study as a way of illustrating the type of work that my team and I do at QUT, Queensland mm -hmm. University of Technology in Australia. So I'm going to sort of talk about that in more brush strokes in some detail, but um, you know, 45 minutes or so we won't have time to go into huge, huge detail, but enough so that you get a sense of the type of work we do, and then I would like to lead into talking a little bit about the team that yeah. um, I work with at QUT and the types of things that we do um, in the LIS space. Um, so I just thought I'd give you some context. Um, oh, my arrow's moved, which is all a bit odd. <laughs> Shifted slightly to the right of my screen. Should be heading to the States. <laughs> but really, I just wanted to show you where I'd come from in relation to where we are here in the US. Um, so quite a, quite a bit of travel to get here, and I'm not looking forward to the travel to get home, easily 24 hours of it, not much fun. Um, and then of course this is Queensland University of Technology, so this is where I come from, in Brisbane, um, which is the capital of the state of Queensland, um, and it's a river city, so uh, the campus I'm on, Gardens Point campus, is dead smack in the middle of the city, and as you can see the river sort of surrounds it, so um, it is a very beautiful spot. Um, and I have the good fortune, you can see where my office is, a little red arrow there, of being located in uh, a new building. So actually it's a, this picture, this photo is a bit of a lie. So the infrastructure you can see there where my office is pointing to, the red arrow, is actually the old infrastructure. This new whiz-bang um, centre got built. Oh, that was about 18 months ago. We got into it. Uh, 230 million Australian dollars, I think I heard them quote as a figure. It's a science and engineering precinct. It's meant to be... To be. It is certainly an enjoyable space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a series of buildings, it's actually about interactive learning spaces and places for academics and researchers and students to engage with technology and, and learning. So it is lovely. But I do have a lovely view as a result um, of the river. And of course, the river is actually an interesting point to point out because of the topic I'm about to talk about, which is natural disasters. So um, the natural disaster, one of the two natural disasters in question, is actually the flood of Brisbane in 2011. So if you look at this, so Brisbane is a river city, so the river is, it, it intertwines and, and um, snap skates, uh, snakes its way around essentially the city itself. And so a flood can and did in 2011 um, and prior to that, 1974, have a major impact upon the infrastructure of people's lives. So um, some photos that people might uh, associate with Australia in one way or another. <laughs> um, and in fact, actually, while I've got it here, I, I have. Um, yeah. Some little fun stuff here for you. Uh, actually, a, a colleague of mine was distraught or a little bit worried that I was perhaps not celebrating Australia Day in true Australian style. So Australia Day um, takes place at the end of January. And so she sent me over a box of um, Australiana stickers and tattoos. And so I've got more than I know what to do with. So hence, I'm sharing with you. So for those who've got children or for those who are young at heart, um, for you to, to play with if you like. Um, but... That's what I guess Australia might look like in its prime. Um, but what I'm here to talk to you about is um, a study that I did um, which looked at some natural disasters that happened in Brisbane and in far north Queensland um, in 2011. So it was summer of 2011. So for us, that's, you know, we're looking at um, January and February, sort of around that period. Um, and these are some, some photos that um, I got from, from the web of, of people taking snapshots of, of what happened to them. It's really quite horrific. Um, and in fact, we've just recently had in Australia um, a cyclone, um, Ita, I think it was ended up calling, um, in far north Queensland. And that literally only last week hit to the coast and they thought it was going to be as bad as the cyclone that um, some of these photos relate to here. Uh, luckily it wasn't, although it still was quite um, significant, it had quite a big impact. Um, for me, I actually was not in Brisbane. I wasn't living in Australia at the time all this was taking place. I was on a um, sabbatical, again. I promise, I don't spend all my time on sabbatical. Um, and I was in Oxford in, in England at the time where this was all happening. So it was quite surreal for me to be sort of, you know, waking up and looking in, you know, on the internet, on Facebook, on, on whatever, and, and seeing all this happening back home and thinking, I'm not there for this, I'm not there for this, this is, a, this is just crazy. Um, and what I did very much appreciate, though, was the power of social media in terms of my experience of being informed and um, having a sense of connection and knowing what's going on with family and friends who, who lived in Brisbane or lived in far north Queensland. 
Um, it was also around the time that I started using Twitter, um, and so I, one of the stimulus was definitely, I, hey, I want to keep informed, I want to know what's going on. Um, so it did get me quite interested in, in the role, I guess, social media is having more and more of people's information world. So as an information researcher, I was quite interested in terms of my own experience as someone being from afar, but also to understand a little bit more what was happening for those who were in the throes of it, as it were. Um, so, to tell you a little bit more about the study in greater detail. So, um, at the time, it, it was quite an interesting period of time for social media. Um, I think it really came to the fore for a lot of people in their lives and they suddenly realised that social media wasn't just about posting photos of kittens or taking photos and posting on Twitter or Facebook. You know, this is the meal I just had at this lovely five-star restaurant. Um, I think people were starting to engage with it and relate to it in a way that they realised that they could get genuine meaning and value and support out and information out of it. Um, and there were some really interesting things that happened. So the Queensland Police Service um, really came to the fore, and I think many people actually point to them as an example of best practice, of um, an agency that engaged with social media in a really powerful way um, during a, a disaster. Um, and as you can see, there's some basic statistics there. Um, well, they have over 163,000 um, fans on their Facebook site, um, and that was really a really primary um, space for them. That's where they were constantly updating and letting people know what's going on, putting photos on areas to avoid or make certain you do this or don't do that. Um, and of course, they had over 10,000 people following them on Twitter. So this is a Queensland police service. I mean, I, so it's quite phenomenal that people were actually engaging with the police service in a way that perhaps they thought they wouldn't, or you know, they couldn't have imagined that that's what we'd be doing with the police, is actually relying upon them in a, in a, a, a new and nuanced way, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and to the Queensland Police's credit, um, they've really realised that what they did was a, a powerful mechanism for that community alliance and that community support and, and getting the trust of community, and they've really continued um, to, to, to sort of augment and build upon that in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, in Twitter, Queensland floods was a hashtag. That could have, you know, as you know, hashtags kind of just spontaneously happen. Um, and Queensland floods became the hashtag, um, I guess, to follow, to communicate, and so forth. And at the um, the height of the floods in Brisbane, um, what's that? Twelve hundred tweets an hour, which is quite extraordinary. Um, Axel Bruns, who is a colleague of mine in the Creative Industries um, faculty of QUT, has done some amazing research in this space. He comes from a communication um, perspective, communication new media sort of domain, and he does a lot of quantitative um, number crunching, looking at trends and patterns and so forth. Um, if, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I'd recommend his work. It's really quite impressive, um, and I think it's just amazing what he does. He's not only looked at um, the Queensland floods and... and um, cyclone and so forth. He has actually looked at the Australian elections, federal elections, and I know he's done some work also with the US federal elections looking to see what's happening in that area. Um, so that's that's very worthwhile looking at. Um, so as I said, you know, I was really, from my own personal experiences, you know, watching and being, I guess, part of the disaster from afar, and also just seeing how social media in very practical terms was being used. As an information researcher, I thought, oh, well, I want to know more about this. I want to get my hands dirty and see what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been a number of studies over the years looking at natural disasters in some way or another, just trying to understand what's going on, how do people relate, how do people engage with each other. Um, so you've got you know, the Japanese um, tsunami, you've got the um, New Zealand earthquakes, there's been some studies there, um, the Southern California fires, there's been some studies there, of course the Axel Brooks that I mentioned before. Um, and there's also been some studies of man-made disasters as well, um, such as the Virginia Tech shootings and things mm -hmm. like that. So um, it is certainly a space where people are curious to learn more. A lot of the research that I found tended to come from either a communication, journalism, new media type bent or perspective, um, which, um, which is great. As an information researcher, though, I guess I was interested to think, well, what happens if I took an information lens to actually looking at this phenomenon, as to looking at this space? Uh, what new insights or, or um, nuances might I learn by doing that? There has been some research done um, from the information perspective. Most of this has tended to be behavioural. Um, and so I am more of a qualitative and experiential researcher. Um, so I thought, well, okay, I'm, I think I've got a piece I can add to the jigsaw puzzle. As, as we know, you know, there's no one study that, that fits the bill and, and tells us everything. So it's about you know, adding, adding more pieces to a jigsaw puzzle as we go along. Um, and so what you can see on the board there, I won't play karaoke, but you can see, <laughs> is essentially the research question that guided this particular study. So I was interested in this idea of information experiences. 
um, I guess this study had two things, was doing two things for me. It was helping to contribute um, an information, experiential information perspective to the growing body of research into natural disasters. But it also then helped me and my research team at QUT to spend a bit of time thinking about reflecting upon well, what is an information experience. So I've kind of put that term out there, but I'm not actually necessarily defining it for you. Um, and there's a slight reasons behind that. I'll give you a moment to read what's on the screen there. Yeah, we definitely agree with that. So we're looking at information experience, I guess, as a complement to the current information behavioural perspectives that are taking place in the LIS research domain. Um, and we can see how those two worlds would sit together and help create a bigger, more holistic picture. Um, so in saying this research looked at information experience, I had that broad conceptualisation of what I understood an information experience to be, and that's grown up out of, or evolved, out of several years of, of my research team and I engaging with experiential studies, looking at people's information use. Um, and it's only recently that we've kind of sort of said, well, let's call this thing information experience. So I, I had some, I guess, um, understanding of what I meant by that term. But I'm also using this study and others, which I will highlight shortly, to help actually provide a more empirical understanding of what actually is an information experience. Um, so I guess the study was, it was serving two purposes for me in many ways. So what did we do? Um, I say we, so there was um, a colleague, research assistant who I hired, who was fun fundamentally important, we wouldn't have survived, survived the research without her, Christine Yates, so she um, was awesome. And so uh, we really worked together on, on conceptualising and putting into place this particular project. We did interviews and observation. What I'm reporting on here will be the interview component only. Um, the observation, um, we did, but it was probably done more as a supplement to the interviews. It was undertaken by um, Lindell Gunn, who is actually was at the time one of our um, LAS master's students, so she's doing her, her um, accreditation to become a librarian. And she was wanting to do some sort of research component as part of her degree, and she was awesome, so she did a wonderful job with that. Um, but it really was the interviews um, which we wanted to look at, because that's where we wanted to get people talking about their lived experiences of, of what was happening with them. Um, in terms of using social media to be informed during the disasters. So, a little bit more detail in terms of future part. We ended up having 21 people take part, as you can see, eight females, seven males. The age range range is there. Ten people were based in Brisbane, so their experience was in, re in regards to the 2011 floods that happened in Brisbane. And then the 15 people took place in Townsville, that's far north Queensland, um, and their experience um, related to um, uh, the cyclone that happened up there at that time. So two different types of natural disasters and um, I must admit it wasn't our intent in the study to compare and contrast. We really didn't have the, the numbers of participants to do that but I think Christine and I would comment that there seem to be very different lived experiences. Um, so what we'd love to do at some point in time is to really tease them apart and actually do some further studies where we actually did 25 interviews with people who experienced floods, 25 people interviews with people who experienced cyclones, um, bushfires, you know, um, um, Victoria and New South Wales in particular and Australia has um, challenges with bushfires, you know, earthquakes, we've got in New Zealand. Not that we want to pray for any natural disasters to happen, which would just seem really wrong and unethical, um, but the idea really is that um, the more we can learn about how people can be informed to, I guess, better manage themselves uh, before, during and after a disaster. I think there's some real pen potential for genuine impact um, and value um, in this. So, yes, but we did see definitely that there were different lived experiences of using social media. Yeah, so that was interesting. Um, what else to tell you? Oh, okay. So, as I said, the two disasters we were looking at took place in early 2011. So, um, it was actually December 2010 and January um, as I said, I wasn't even in Australia, so when did this research take place? It took place 12 months later. Um, so one of the pros and cons, I guess, of that happening, the, the, pro, the con, I guess, is that, okay, to what extent do people genuinely still have a strong memory, um, lived, you know, are they still able to tap into that lived experience? Um, probably I'd say the answer was yes, they were. If it was anything longer than 12 months after that, anything longer than the 12-month time frame, I'd probably still question it. Um, I was really um, 
one impressed by the generosity of people. You know, these are Joe Blow citizens who literally just volunteered and said, yes, we'll come and have a chat with you. Um, the interviews lasted for about an hour. They were great and generous with their time. Um, and I was really impressed. People, it, it obviously was a very big moment. Um, and so it stayed with them. So even 12 months afterwards, people had very strong memories of um, what happened at various days, points throughout the, the period that we're talking about. Um, the pro would be, it was 12 months later, mm -hmm. the emotional side of things had perhaps tapered down a little bit or had perhaps become, they were able to come less removed or more removed from it. Um, I could see how people might argue, well, you should be doing it as close to the time itself. I would also want to be conscious of the uh, negative psychological impact I can have. You know, someone's just had their house torn down or lost a, a loved one, and here I am chasing them after an MP3 audio recording. Can I interview you? Um, so I did find 12 months after the fact actually had that positive effect that people were able to be ref very reflective, um, and so they themselves had perhaps reached a, a stronger sense of measure of awareness of their experience, um, and to. I was not risking any potential harm on them um, in terms of, of, of exasperating the, the, the negative experience and social the consequences. So some of the people I interviewed, you know, they, some people lost everything, you know, house gone. Um, uh, so yeah, so pros and cons. Um, in terms of the interviews itself, they were all audio recorded. Um, the we approached a, 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 a semi-structured sort of you know deep narrative type approach to to gathering the data. Um, and we really wanted to simply let the people um, who we were talking to tell their story as much as we can. So we had some set questions we asked, um, but there weren't as many really. We kind of started off, and I'll give you an example with, can you tell me about your experience in using social media during the flood or during the cyclone, insert whatever the case was. Um, and then we, we, we essentially probed off from there, and there were a couple of other questions we asked, but that was the main one. And the point to highlight there is that you'll note we didn't use, actually use the phrase information experience. Um, and that was done intentionally. We thought, well, information experience, that's our name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's what we call this construct, this thing that we're wanting to explore. But it's probably not going to mean anything to Joe Blow citizen. Um, and so we wanted to take the onus of them and having to work hard in the interview and put it on us as the researchers. So what we did was we tried to make it as um, accessible as possible to the person we're interviewing spending time with talking to, just for us, for them to tell their story. And then it was up to us as the more experienced researchers, the ones who actually had the, the theory driving us, to make sure we were asking the right probing questions, exploring, you know, in the right way. Um, and then of course when it came to the analysis, that's when we really had to sit down and go, well okay, what, what, where is the, the phenomenon here that we're investigating? Um, the analysis we did together as much as possible. So once again, as I said, you know, we had a a broad brushstroke of what we thought we understood information experience to be, but we we're also using the research as a way of helping to provide empirical sort of guidance on what that construct actually is. Um, so we sat down together, and I think it was the first, oh, I think it was the first eight from memory, I think four from Brisbane and four from Townsville, that we, we literally sat and coded together. So we had the interview transcripts in front of us and we just sat there coding together, talking about the coding, talking about what parts of the transcripts we're looking at. Um, and we did that intentionally because we were conscious that we needed to make certain that we were on the same page, mm -hmm. that we weren't just looking at social media experiences in natural disasters, but rather the construct, of the, the object of study was information experiences in social media in natural disasters. So we did spend a lot of time sometimes looking at um, excerpts of, of quotes, of of the interviews go, oh, this is really interesting, it says da da da, and we have to keep coming back and saying, yes, but is that actually about information experience and social? So um, that was part of that, that definite process of, of as I said, so the study had, you know, in some ways two goals. Um, and so we did that, and after doing that, we came up with what were essentially three lenses and eight themes, and I do actually have a little handout for you. Let me give that one to you. Perfect. Okay. So the handout provides a summary of each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm going to say watch this space. We have literally probably about three quarters through writing up a journal article um, reporting the findings. So one of the things we did, so we did coding and you know we've gone through different layers of coding and, and eventually generating some themes. And as a part of the process of um, 
writing up a journal article, we've, in some ways we've also done an extra layer of analysis on top of that. So we've actually gone back and checked and verified things and, and I had arguments and discussions around, mm, you know, is connected really what we want this thing to be called? What's really going on here? Looking back at the transcript and the data. So it has actually been quite a, um, uh, an ex extended analysis process and, and we did that with intent because we knew that we were trying to do two goals at the same time. But as I said, watch this space. We're almost ready to submit an article for publication um, <laughs> soonish. Uh, but this is what the, the three uh, lenses and eight themes came out to be for us. So tool, individual, and community. And I, I think yeah. they're relatively self-explanatory there. So tool really was focusing on the two themes that fell in under this. Really focused on well, social media as an information tool, as an information resource. Um, individual was very much focusing on perhaps more the individual information experiences. Um, and then community was the fact that well, social media also enabled and fostered that, that more engagement of community external. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was sort of just a, a way that we could sort of, um, I guess, summarise them. Um, and you'll see, and I'm not going to play, um, I won't read it out to you. I'll give you actually a moment just to have a browse over the handout. It's just on two sides. Mm -hmm. um, you'll see the handout has a description of the theme, followed by a couple of example quotes from the, the data itself. stood out for us was the fact that people's information experiences in social media, natural disasters, really wasn't what, it's what people found informing. Mm -hmm. So we also, in doing the interviews, we really tried to avoid the word information. Um, the term information, in some ways people automatically assume, oh information, that's words on a page, text on a screen. Um, we really didn't want people to come um, just with their pre-existing ideas of what information is. We actually generally wanted to know well, what was your lived experience. Um, so we're probably more interested in the idea of what people found informing. Um, and that phrase probably helped open up, I guess, the more holistic experience. So what we certainly observe, and you'll see, as I said, in the write-up when it comes out, hopefully, um, that people's, what people found informing in social media during a natural disaster was many and varied and quite complex and rich. It wasn't necessarily just words. And I think that's also one of the beautiful things of social media is that people can share lots of things through it. Um, but it was also, what people found also informing was almost um, emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, I think what, and this is an aspect I think we will we'll definitely want to explore further, is just this, this people do have a lived experience of um, things informing them in their life, whatever the context may be, um, that are far more complex and nuanced and far more um, evolved than perhaps what we have traditionally considered to be information in our, in our research domains, um, in the EIA space. Um, so that's definitely something that I think comes that's coming out to play in this particular work. But as I said, I, 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 that handout, I'm actually happy to provide a um, e-version of it. That would be great. Yeah, that's, that's not an issue. Yes, definitely. Perfect. Yes. So that way those who might be watching um, can be sitting, I want to have a look at that too. They can definitely do that. Uh, as I said, it is, it's just a, a product summary of each of the themes um, and a journal article, so providing much more richer, detailed, nuanced understandings. Um, we were conscious that we didn't want to be doing this research just for research sake or just to help us develop our researchers' interest in this concept of information experience. So we really did want to make certain that we, we tend to be, as a, as, a, as, as a group, the team at QUT tend, do tend to try to be more applied researchers. Um, so we do want to improve practice or impact upon the way people are living their life um, and hoping doing whatever the case may be. Um, and indeed, in February of 2011, the Australian government released the first National um, Disaster Resilience Strategy. Um, and that strategy highly uh, acknowledged and very much recognised the role that information, technology and learning plays in ensuring people can be resilient 
um, that they can be well prepared for and able to better recover from a natural disaster if and when it takes place. Um, and so we looked at that and said, well, okay, our research can actually help that. So if the government's still saying we need to be doing things to help put into place strategies, processes, systems that can foster and build resilience in community, I think we can take an information perspective on that and we can offer some um, ideas on how we, um, government and other agencies can support access to information and then support people to be informed. Um, so as part of that strategy, yes I do, um, we actually went to a, we, we formed a reference group um, and you can see the names of some of the people who took part in that reference group um, and they, they were there to be critical friends along the journey of the research. So it is a 12 month study so uh, you know there were some pragmatics involved so it would have been wonderful to interview more than 25 people, it would have been wonderful to you know, even spend more time on the analysis than what we did. Um, and certainly I think there's, there's room for more research but is that the nature of any research project really? the fun of it. Um, there's always more things to play around with. We, we, we had um, a series of one-on-one -on -one chats with um, the, the focus, the reference group members. We tried to do a focus group but they were all so too busy, uh, which was fine. And what we ended up doing was literally just having a one-on-one -on -one chat with them. Um, and we presented um, these preliminary um, themes at the time. And we sort of said, well, okay, here's some things. What's your reaction to these? So as people who are responsible for, um, you know, so we've got um, people who are part of the Local Government Association of Queensland and they're providing advice, strategies and support to the governments across Queensland, um, the local government agency across Queensland on, on social media um, and on helping communities in times of resilience. So, you know, we've got Craig Evans, Disaster Response and Recovery from the Brisbane City Council. So these were people whose job it is, is essentially to, to, to do. Um, and so we wanted to know, well, what's your reaction to the themes? What sort of response do you have? How might these inform your work um, and inform the work of others whose job it is, is to support community and individuals during a natural disaster? And um, they came back with, I guess, more questions than anything else. And that was totally fine with us. And we, that's where we thought, actually, there's, there's room for more research, more, more spending time with people and actually understanding things a little bit more. So some of the sorts of questions that they asked was, um, bear with me while I look at my notes because I have a terrible memory. Um, they had strong interest in um, social media and organisations like local governments and councils and public libraries um, being part of all this, but they wanted to know how can they do it so it didn't require significant infrastructure or resourcing. So budgets are tied. How can they do that in such a way? They were also wanting to know questions around centralisation or decentralisation of the, the, the messages and who's in charge of all doing that. Um, they wanted to know what happens outside of the times of the natural disaster in terms of the where resources for communications are deployed and pay for. So, you know, a natural disaster, you don't know when it's going to happen. It tends not, thankfully, to happen for too long. So if you're massively putting a lot of infrastructure and resources into it, what happens after that? What happens, you know, during the lifespan of the, the next 10 months before the next disaster takes place. Um, they were really fascinated by the individual theme because the individual theme really highlighted the emotional, psychological, the, 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 that sort of degree of support and that that in itself was a way of people being informed um, and helping each other. Um, so they asked questions like, should organisations be involved in helping to connect individuals and communities during a natural disaster, or should they focus solely on the information provision? Um, so a lot of the, the, the things that they were doing up until now really was that perhaps old school, we will provide information out. Mm -hmm. um, whereas what this research has really shown is that, you know what, people can do that themselves. And sometimes what they want is more can, being able to be connected to my community who is sitting in Townsville, you know, cowering in the corner in their cupboard waiting for a cyclone to hit. How can we facilitate that? They don't need to be known a cyclone's on its way. They could kind of gather that already. So, you know, they're looking for other ways of being informed, being informed that my loved ones are safe, being informed that there are others out there like me and that I'm not sitting in this cupboard alone, that, you know, others are in their homes doing whatever they need to do. Um, they wanted to know about should aspects relating to emotional, psychological and social be support left to community? Um, what are the implications if organisations do or don't get involved in this type of informational support? Um, are organisations ready and mature enough to deal with these types of aspects? 
Um, and do they have the necessary skill and knowledge to do this psychology counselling? So a lot of the people who are responsible for these types of services, they're communications people, they might be information people, um, but what this study is showing is that people's information experiences does have this, this emotional, psychological, this other, other element intertwined within it, and it's hard to tease them apart. Um, in the community aspect, they were looking at um, you know, that, that letting go of control, you know, so yes, okay, we're seeing uh, one of the themes was journalism, citizen journalism, you know, people basically getting out there and taking their own photos and reporting what's happening to themselves because they can now, because they've got social media allows them to become their own little mini, you know, media site. Um, and so they're starting to question, you know, sh to what extent should we harness the power of the people who are out there, the citizens who are doing this citizen journalism type of thing. Um, what's the potential for this type of activity to harm people or the community by involving citizens in this way? Um, what are the benefits or risks of letting go of control and providing that information? And does there need to be a shift in the mindset to one of greater co-creation and participation, seeing citizens as equal partners and not just as victims during a natural disaster? So those were sort of things that popped up during our conversation with our reference group, and I thought they were really important and powerful things. So one, one thought did have to my one thought Christine and I had was that it would be actually interesting to to do a study that looked at the other side of the coin. So we've kind of we've looked at well, what's the Joe Blow citizens lived experience? Um, let's go into some of the organisations um, who are providing these sorts of informational social media support. Um, what's their lived experience during a natural disaster? And see if we can actually sort of join the, the two sides together and find out what sort of mismatch or connection there is or what needs to be done for there to be stronger connections. And I think the questions they've raised um, as part of the reference group were, were valid and were very interesting ones. Um, but then um, we, they can't be ignored and I think they also can't ignore the fact that there is such power coming out. Um, and you'll see that in the write-up of the themes that people are helping themselves in very, very powerful ways. Um, and certainly what came out in this study, and we I, I've definitely seen in other studies I've seen written um, about looking at people's experiences in social media and natural disasters, is that people do behave themselves. So one of the comments I got from people is saying, oh, you know, people just, just put lies out there and they, they're, they're out to manipulate and they're out to, to, to do wrong um, on social media. May or may not be the case, I'm not commenting on that, but what I certainly saw here, and what, as I said, I've seen some write-ups and other research in natural disasters, that there does seem to be social norms that soon get set. And people soon realise that actually, now's not the time for you to be putting out misleading or wrong information or causing mischief or, um, you know, so people seem to naturally adopt roles and naturally seem to understand that, no, this is about social good and behaving as a community of support together. Um, I'm not saying that always happens, but certainly um, it's what we saw here. And I do remember, was it the Virginia Tech um, shootings? Mm -hmm. uh, I read an article for, that they did some studies there, and that's what they also observed, that there seemed to be those who were on social media at the time engaging and talking about it. There was a, no, this is how we will conduct ourselves. Um, so I think there's hope. Mm -hmm. I think there's gen genuinely hope for the power of social media to have, a, ha have some good in the way we live out. So I do need to acknowledge um, some people who are involved in this. So this was a funded project from Powder. Um, as I said, it was a 12-month project, uh, so it was pretty action-packed during that 12 months. Um, so I do thank them. I do thank the project student, Lindell Gunton, um, my research assistant, Christine Yates, who's really my partner in crime. Um, and so she was invaluable in helping us um, really do everything that needed to be done. The project reference group. And we also had our external evaluator, um, Rebecca Inyon, who um, was wonderful in terms of just being that critical friend to the journey. So I guess that was the study, but in some ways that study is really representative of the type of work that my team at QUT and I engage in. Um, so I wanted to sort of, sort of slightly shift gears a little bit and tell you a little bit about us. Um, so that's Australia. <laughs> um, they, each of those um, arrows point to a university that offers an ALIA, Australian Library Information Association, accredited degree. So ALIA is the ALA yeah. equivalent, essentially. Um, so what I wanted to highlight to you was the big star in New South Wales, the green star there. <laughs> that is Charles Sturt University. Um, unlike um, Northern America, Australia doesn't have library schools as such. Um, Charles Sturt University is the only library school in Australia. Um, the rest that the arrows point to, including myself at QUT in Brisbane, are 
uh, offer Alia accredited degrees in other mm -hmm. schools. So I am situated in the School of Information Systems in a Faculty of Science and Engineering. The faculty consists of six schools. Um, so I sit embedded within a school where the majority of my colleagues, my academics, have nothing to do with LIS. They're more um, hardcore information systems, business process management type academics and researchers. Um, so, and, and we're pretty representative, I think, of the experiences of, of everybody else here. They'll all be in different areas, though. So, um, let me see if I can think of some. I think Curtin University, I think they're sitting in the humanities at the moment. Um, uh, RMIT are in business, I think, from memory. So, we all have slightly different masters to serve. So, um, I'm in science and engineering. I'm not sure, but that's where I am. Um, that's more to do with the history historical merging of differing units and I started off originally in the faculty of IT but yeah. Um, so we, we are situated in different areas and I think that's quite interesting um, in terms of the fact that we're not just all in a area of IT or, or arts or business or education. We, we do have different contexts. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's us up there, QUT. So um, that's the photos of my team. <laughs> We are a relatively small team, um, so there are four full-time academics and we've got one postdoctoral fellow. Um, we have a number of um, adjuncts and sessionals. Now, I know adjunct means a different thing here in Australia, yeah. in the North, uh, the North America. Um, so an adjunct professor is an honorary title. Um, they are, they have to be a professor, so they are a full professor. Um, many of the people who are adjunct professors are perhaps in semi-retirement. Like um, emeritus. Yeah, kind of, yeah. kind of like an emeritus. Um, they might help out still with some supervision of research students or sitting on um, panels for research students doing presentations and assessment and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and they might still be engaged in some research. Um, not all, not all are semi-retired. Some are uh, got full-time jobs in other universities. But yeah. And then it's our, our sessional lectures and our tutors are perhaps what you might call an adjunct or what they're the ones who might have a full-time job elsewhere and kind of just exactly. marking and tutoring and doing stuff for us. Yeah. We have been growing over the last few years, which is a really exciting thing for us. We've um, intentionally been trying to um, uh, uh, push forward in that space. Um, once again, it's a case of we're not a school. We are a degree sitting in a school, sitting in a faculty, sitting in a university. So um, we can risk being um, invisible. So mm -hmm. we're making a lot of concerted efforts to make certain that we are visible. Um, and that the LIS space at QUT has, um, has, a, has, a, has a face, has a presence. Yeah. Um, and so we work really hard to make sure that now you know, heads of the universities know who we are. Um, and so we've, we've got about 30 research students at the moment. We have a wonderful partnership with the San Jose State University's uh, School of Library Information Sciences. Um, and we've been working with them now since 2008. Um, we've had five PhD graduations. Um, we're expecting some more students coming in, so that's a cohort-based program, um, which is wonderful. It's, it's actually um, a really rich and rewarding experience in the sense that we get to, I guess, learn about each other's different different worlds of being an academic. So the North American versus the Australian context. There's lots of similarities. There's also really fun differences, which is which is great. And we've also been building up our coursework student numbers. So at the moment, roughly 120. I say roughly. You can never know these figures exactly. They always jump around. For roughly about 120 coursework students in our master's degree, we offer it only at master's level. Um, in Australia, you can actually get um, accreditation um, to be a librarian at the master's and the um, grad dip, mm -hmm. and at the bachelor's level. Um, you'll find that bachelor's is perhaps slowly dying out. We're seeing that numbers are starting to move on, and I think that's just a lot of um, recognition that there's that, that credential keep creep. Uh, the fact that Masters is perhaps more universally recognised internationally. Um, so we, we certainly have a Masters um, and that's, that we won't be going. We used to have a Bachelors but we stopped doing that in 2004 up thereabouts. So um, it's a really um, dynamic and interesting group of people we've got working with us. Um, in about, goodness I always forget, 2008, 2008, 2009, um, we moved from a traditional face-to-face master's of course into a more blended um, and that was just simply a case of reality um, if we were going to continue to survive um, we needed to recognize that we needed to be able to attract students who weren't physically based in Brisbane so more and more we're seeing a lot of our coursework students and indeed our research students so it's not just the students in the San Jose program who are based in North America I have a number of students in the UAE and other parts of, of Australia but our coursework students now are, um, are all across Australia uh, we're also finding that a lot of our Brisbane-based students are uh, not always necessarily physically coming to class and, and they're taking advantage of the fact that, well, you know, I do have children or elderly parents or 
work commitments or whatever. So they're taking advantage of that whole blended learning. So that for us is also a really interesting space that we're spending a lot of time um, researching and exploring and getting to know as much as we can. So back to that information experience thing that I, I was sort of talking about. Um, so information experience is probably a term we've recently only settled on in the last couple of few years or so. But in reality, the team and I have been doing information experience research for quite some time. In fact, I'd say it's really started with Christine Bruce's seminal work, Seven Faces of Information Literacy, which came out in 1997. Mm -hmm. So she's um, one of my colleagues um, in QUT. And so perhaps very much inspired by, she did phenomenography, but very closely related to the world of phenomenology. Um, so you can see where perhaps that was the stimulus for our focus on lived experiences, informational life worlds. And as a result, most of the team is, is more qualitative um, and interpretative to researchers. Um, what we're toying and playing with is in the last couple of years is actually articulating that what we do is information experience research. And we're articulating in two ways, as a research domain and as a research object. Now I'd say for the last, well, since 1997, if not before, we've been doing information experience as a research domain. Mm -hmm. So we've been taking an experiential lens to the way we explore people's information use um, using different qualitative methods, be it grounded theory, phenomenology, phenomenography, critical incident technique, ethnography, and so forth. What we're probably playing more with, and this is where my study that I was just talking to you about comes into play, is the idea, well, is information experience also a research object? Okay, if it's a research object, what would it look like or how would it compare to other research objects such as information seeking or information literacy mm -hmm. or so forth and so forth. So there have been very few studies looking at information experience as an object of study and I've got a couple on the board there which um, are happening at the moment um, in some way or another. So information experience of new mums, that's definitely information experience as an object of study. Um, the others are probably more research domain type spaces. But they're examples of the types of things that we're doing in this area. So we have a book coming out. Um, Emerald says April 28th, but I'm actually thinking it's probably more likely August September. Um, just the nature of these sorts of things that always drag on and take time. But we're, we're thrilled by it. And this is a book that will introduce the concept of information experience, um, both as a research domain and as a research object. It will um, the chapters are uh, contributed by uh, a number of people all over the, the world, in fact, not just people from our team. Um, and they've all done research in some way that either falls under one of the two domains. And in their study, they're not only, in their chapter, they not only talk about their research, their findings, but they also talk about, well, actually, what does this research say then about information experience as an object or as a domain? Um, so we're hoping that that um, is a conversation starter and will actually help um, you know, move conversations forward and discourse forward. It certainly helped us as a team. Um, so we, we started essentially because we wanted to try and um, consolidate our own thinking and our own conceptualisation of the space and help us to articulate, you know, well, what do we mean by this thing? Um, yeah. So one chapter I'm going to point out to you, which is in the blue box down there, mm -hmm. um, and that's a chapter that Christine Yates and I wrote. Um, and it is a chapter that specifically talks about the two domains, object, uh, research domain and um, research study, uh, research object study. Um, and what we did is we talk about this particular study I've, I've talked about here today, because um, that was a study where it both is an information experience research domain, but it also has information experience as the object of study. We also did another um, pilot study, much, much smaller study, where it fell into the domain of information experience research, mm -hmm. but the object of study was information literacy. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing in this particular chapter is we're saying, and that study also looked at natural disasters, information literacy in natural disasters. So we've got two studies, both are about natural disasters, both fall into information experience as a research domain, but they each have differing informational objects. So one is information literacy and one is um, information experience. And so we spend a little bit of time in that chapter saying, okay, <laughs> what did we learn from this? You know, what, what observations might we have to make? You know, can we say what makes information experience as an object of study different to information literacy as an object of study? Um, tentative, tentative comments at the moment. Um, as I said, we'll, we'll know, I think as we do more research, we'll be able information experience as an object of study. We'll be able to, I think, have a, a more richer conversation extend our thinking in that space. 
but wait, there's more. There's always more. <laughs> uh, so information experience certainly is a, an area of great passion for myself and for my team. But we, we, we are, like many um, LIS teaching and research teams, um, very nuanced and got lots of things going on. Um, so there's some other things that we've got happening or have happened. Um, one at the moment we've got is a national study. So the Australian Research Council funded this. And so one area that I have interest in is evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. um, and to me that, that is a an inf type of information experience that, you know, it's using evidence information, what we find informing to inform our own professional practice as allies professionals and practitioners. And so that's a three-year study. We're about halfway through and we've been working with Ross Todd from Rutgers University on that one. Um, and a date saver, um, we will be hosting for the second time um, the International um, Evidence-Based evidence Library Information Practice Conference. So that's on the 6th and 8th of July in 2015. So watch this space. It's a lovely time of year to be in Brisbane. It is winter, it's but awesome. our winters aren't really like your winters here. <laughs> so I think you'll find it quite enjoyable. So, um, watch the space. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at EBLIP8, um, eight, at EBLIP8, um, and that will just keep you up to date on what's happening. Um, but we do hope you'll come along and, and just take part of that one. Um, we also, as I said, we've been doing a lot more stuff in the area of blended learning. So we've got, so we've had a number of grants over the years, and this is one current one that we've got at the moment. Um, where we're looking at um, the student-centred perspective mm -hmm. on, on the fact that we've got two different modes of, of students working with us and how do we, I guess, integrate, build community, build quality learning experiences. Yeah, that's the, the usual sort of stories, but it's something we're really interested and very passionate about. And the other one I wanted to highlight to you um, was a project that we finished um, a couple of years ago, um, but it was one of the first times in Australia where every ALIA accredited University with an early accredited degree took part in a study, and the study is aimed to try and establish a benchmark with what's happening in LS education in Australia. What are, what are the, the gaps? What are the issues? And what could we be doing to move forward? So it was really exciting. It was um, quite a challenge because it was the first time you know we've all worked together. It was you know across all the different states of Australia and very very busy academics. But I think we came up with some really interesting findings, and we're we're all of us slowly you know you know. You know, knocking away and hopefully trying to address some of the things that came out in that particular study. So just to show some of the richness of the sorts of things that, that we do. And finally, this is where I get to um, plead and beg for your help. <laughs> so another study I've been working on is also looking at information experiences in Twitter, in this case. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, thank you. So <laughs> volunteers, please, volunteers, please. Um, this is um, a study I actually started when I was in Oxford a couple of years back um, and I've done some work on it in Brisbane and I thought while I was here in the States, you know, I take advantage of the fact that I can do some data collection here. So I am looking at people for, for people who use Twitter in their everyday life. Mm -hmm. Now I understand not everyone, it's not as easy to divide everyday life versus work life versus study life. I appreciate it, it it's interblended and, and intermingled. Um, but really what I'm trying to focus on is, is, is people just using it to live their life and to be informed about whatever it is that is going on in their life. Not so much the work stuff, not so much the, um, the study stuff. Um, so if you do know anyone, I would certainly love to hear from you. It's relatively painless, I promise. It's just me sitting and having a coffee with you and getting you to talk about your experiences with Twitter. Um, so I'm looking for people who are many and varied um, so, um, all walks of life, from those who are new to Twitter to those who are complete now to Twitter addicts with multiple accounts. Um, so, more the merrier, so please contact me, that would be wonderful.